Thank you, everybody, for coming. How many people came because they saw the robots and thought, what the heck is that? Did at least stick your head in the room? Or were you planning already coming? We got one. OK, so we got one person. That's Aaron. Yeah, we almost ran in yours when you weren't done. Um, oh, I hope so. So it worked. OK. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. My name is Brian Potter. I'm Amy Woodall. And we are psycho people who are going to talk to you about doing psycho things. <laughs> um, we're going to talk to you today about creating a spectacle and running a flash mob and uh, how it works for business and how it works for your members and all that good stuff. So um, let's get to it. This charming creature is Amy. And uh, why don't you talk a little bit about what you do and all that stuff. I am going to sit because this is Sure. Weird. Hi, I'm Amy Woodall. And I am the leader of the flock at Black Sheep. We are a PR firm that does social media, PR, marketing, and events, but what sets us apart is that we also incorporate experiential marketing into our marketing mix. And, and what that means is generally um, what you might be familiar with, flash mobs, gaming techniques, and other experiences, essentially, that allow people to come in and participate with the brand and to experience the brand and to have a feeling of community with the brand uh, as well. So uh, that's kind of it. I guess we have a side arm of our company called STUNT. It stands for the Society of Troublemakers Uniting in the Name of Theatrics. And our stunt club helps to fuel our efforts with various brands as far as creating these flash mob experiences. It's, it's sort of our little tribe of troublemakers. So I'm, I'm also the founder of the stunt club. And I've, I've been in the, the PR industry for about 11 years now and started Black Sheep two and a half years ago because I noticed that the economy was changing a little bit and the way that marketing works was changing a little bit and that people in general were expecting a little bit more out of the way that brands communicated with them and allowed them to be a part of shaping the brand. So um, so that's kind of what Black Sheep is all about. Uh, and again, I'm Brian Potter. Um, I started the Houston Flash Mob. There are many people who call themselves the Houston Flash Mob, but we are the Houston Flash Mob. Um, at Shipple, I'm the video content specialist, so I do video production for Shipple. Uh, I've done that for over 10 years. I was in-house media director at Lakewood Church, um, and I worked on a television show, and none of this has to do with Flash Mob stuff, so I'll talk about that. Um, the reason that I started the Houston Flash Mob is that uh, I moved to Houston and I saw I'm a big fan of improv everywhere. How many people have heard of improv everywhere? Huge group, hundreds of millions of, of hits on the YouTube stuff and on the website alone. Uh, and I thought, wow, that'd be awesome. Now, I started doing theater when I was about six years old. So I've been involved in theater in all different areas, either from acting to directing to lighting, all kinds of stuff. So I thought, I'd love to do something here in Houston. Uh, let's do, I wanted to do a pillow fight, actually, was the first thing that we did. We did it at the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, in that little crosswalk there. Anybody ever heard of Caroline Collective, Matthew Wettery and that guy? Uh, he brought a feather pillow, <laughs> and that burst out at the end. That was a lot of fun. And the reason that I started the Houston Flash Mob is because I didn't just find anybody who was doing it on a collective kind of basis. There was no group, there was no website. HoustonFlashMob.com was available. I was like, score! Um, so. I wanted to start something, and I, our, the purposes of the Houston Flash Mob and the, our tagline is, is because too many people take themselves too seriously too often. And I knew that if I didn't do something like a flash mob or something like that, I'd probably end up on a roof on the news or something like that. So it's sort of a, an outlet for me to, to get it out the door. So that's why I started the Houston Flash Mob, and that, that's why we do what we do, is to create fun, safe, exciting, experiences for those around us and for the people participating. That's our mission statement, to create a fun experiences for ourselves and the people around us. So that's what we do the Houston Flash Mob for. So let me jump in really quick yeah. and say that Brian and I are gonna kind of have a dialogue going up here. I do this for brands uh, professionally and very strategically, and Brian, as he just mentioned in his tagline, does it to create experiences, fun, and entertainment for the public and the people participating. So uh, at times he's going to talk in that direction and I may jump in and, and bring up points that you need to know when you're doing this for your company or for your brand 
And when I'm talking about doing it for your brand or your company, he's going to jump in from the participant side and the entertainment side and sort of the organic side to maybe keep some things in mind for um, making sure that the people who are participating in your flash mob or in your experience that you're creating are still having a good time and keeping that uh, in mind. So at times it may seem that we are It's like Microsoft in, and Woodstock. Jumping in and <laughs> cutting each other off, but we just want to make sure that we show you a balance uh, <laughs> for both sides, e either business or, or entertainment. So. Uh, what we want to do also is we want to show you a video. Everybody loves video. Uh, so this is, I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the Improv Everywhere group, and that's not right, so let's go ahead and do this. <laughs> this is a video that has 28 million hits. Um, oh good, an error occurred, awesome. So, this me... is not part of the stunt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we will talk about creating the unexpected. Sometimes that happens when yeah, you don't intend no it internet. to. I have no internet. I have technology. Uh, click on the Wi-Fi. It may be that it switched over to. Yeah, it did. It's like, oh, you can do a presentation? How about no? <laughs> Here we go. It's pulling up. I feel like Steve Jobs. Can everybody turn off their Wi-Fi, please? We're trying to do a presentation. <laughs> Too soon for the Steve Jobs. Oh, that, that wasn't a knock. That wasn't a knock. <laughs> no, no. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. No, that was a. Uh, Okay, this may not load. I'll let this load in the background, I think. And if we start hearing some audio, we'll know it's playing, so that'll be our cue. Um, I was going to show you a video. Oh, seriously? For love of Pete. Okay, do you want to move on? I think I want to move on. Because it's not doing my thing. That was a video of... Um, <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I do want to explain it, though. Um, maybe I'll explain it while it's, it's trying to load. Uh, it was Improv Everywhere did this thing at Grand Central Station in New York City. And uh, they got an enormous amount of people. It was, I think one of the, uh, it inspired me to do the freeze. We did a freeze at, um, oh look, I'm awesome. Uh, we did a freeze at the um, Edwards Cinema off of I-10 by Ikea, you guys know that area? We almost got arrested, it was awesome. Um, <laughs> the managers, you wanna freak people out? Freeze in the middle of a movie theater. What's going on? I think we need to get up there right now. Um, so uh, it, it's uh, a bunch of people at Grand Central Station. They had like 15 cameras, and it's a beautiful shot because there's a big wide shot of the ground, and all of a sudden, half the people down there just stop. And one of my favorite things that they did in it was they um, there was a couple, and they, they were kissing. And they held, they like freeze kissing, and that was kind of cool. And then there's people like helping somebody load a piece of luggage. And, uh, uh, and there's people walking around them, and they're, you can see the looks on their faces. My favorite stuff is when you see like two people, and they're like, what's going on over there? What is that? And they're on each other's phones, and they're texting, and they're taking, there's pictures of people taking pictures. And what's, what's happening is they're taking pictures, and they're getting video, and they're talking about it, and they're calling. They're on their phone. Like, you won't believe what's happening right now. You see them. And uh, that's a... That's a demonstration for those of you who are visually impaired. I think we're going to give up on the video, yeah. but um, what what Brian is is talking about is is um, creating the unexpected. So I think we can jump into that next slide. Uh, Let it sink in. Images by Brian in this presentation. He <laughs> has great great interpretations of our of our uh, Word, word choice here. So, um, so creating the unexpected and and how that affects the people around us. Um, so that's why flash mobs, why experiential marketing, why stunts are so successful because they're unexpected. That's a keyword that we use around our office all of the time when we're brainstorming and we're creating some sort of an experience for a brand. The number one word that we use after we've come up with ideas is unexpected. Is it unexpected enough, or how can we make it more unexpected? Because when it's unexpected, it creates those reactions. It creates those people whispering to each other and asking, what's happening? What's going on? Did you see that? It creates the people whipping out their phones to take pictures or to take video. And then what do they do? They go and share that information. So. Um, you know, imagine that you're walking to work and you encounter a flash mob, or you encounter a guy in a gorilla suit, or you encounter something that's unexpected. The first reaction that you have is to go and tell someone what you saw. 
And that's why on our side, um, that's why it's, it's entertaining for them, but it's also so successful for brands because it creates that viral word of mouth uh, storytelling. It creates the sharing and it creates that stuff, not from a brand perspective, not that brand saying, guess what we did. It creates all of these ambassadors and witnesses that then go out and say, guess what I saw? Guess what Black Sheep did? Guess what Shipple did? Guess what their clients did? Um, so that's, in our minds, why it's so successful, because it's unexpected, but then, more importantly, it spurs action. It, it spurs that conversation and gets people to start talking. Yeah, you see all the time, people are used to um, seeing uh, billboards and commercials and stuff like that, but you probably didn't expect to sit in your session today and have a bunch of people carrying cardboard robots interrupt you completely. And you probably thought to yourself, what is this? You know what I mean? And you're like, oh, this is interesting. So creating the expected is extremely important. The other thing is exciting. It's a lot of fun. Flash mob guys in the back, did you have a good time hanging out and doing the thing, right? They came out on a Friday. They're so committed and they, they think it's so exciting and so much fun to do this. They're going to come out at you know 11 o'clock in the morning on their Friday and, and do it. Um, it builds excitement and, and people share it with it and it helps to, to grow your organization. And, and it's not just um, setting up a tent with 92.5. You know, It's something different and exciting and, and fun to go off of. Brian obviously has a great radio voice, <laughs> but he's going to chime in every now and then. I love to talk on the radio. Um, you want to switch to the next yeah. slide? Uh, so one of the things from a brand perspective that led us to start utilizing this tactic with our clients, um, I mean, really, it was one of the foundations of our business. And the reason for that is that with the advent of social media and just the increase of sharing online. I mean, most of us can probably agree that people overshare online. Um, there's just constant information going out. And I'm sure everyone in this room has trouble keeping up with it. I know I do. It's, it's a constant struggle for me on a daily basis to figure out what to pay attention to and what's important and how to filter all of that down and what the best way to keep track of it is, whether it's RSS feeds or you know, curating things on, on my Twitter feed that I need to watch. Um, so that's a big struggle, and that translates over to the marketing mix and what you need to be doing as a brand. There's so much clutter, so you, you've, you've got to step up your game in order to get attention. So one of the reasons why flash mobs or general experiences, publicity stunts, um, you know, other viral material is so effective is that it's more interesting and more entertaining and more shared than anything else. So. Um, cutting through the clutter is really important, and this is one really effective way to do it. Um, you know, oversharing is is a is a big problem, but it's also a great asset for uh, you as as business owners and and marketers. Um, when you create great content, the oversharing becomes a real power tool for you. So. Um, that's one, one reason why flash mobs and, and these things are so effective. Just the entertainment value and the, the ability to share it and cut through the clutter. Which conveniently leads us to? Creating viral conversation and igniting word of mouth. This is something that I, I've kind of already touched on, but uh, it's really important when a brand is talking about themselves and Coke or Pepsi or, or one of these big major brands, Adidas, any of these brands are saying, we're so great and here's why we're great. You may listen, but it's the brand telling you how great they are. So when you create these experiences that either the public witnesses or gets to participate in, when you engage with them, you're building that community of ambassadors so that these people are then and going talking about you won't believe what Coke did. I don't know, how many of y'all have seen The Happiness Project, The Coke Happiness Project? Okay, so it's a really awesome, um, it's become viral uh, component of their campaign, but it, it was a strategy um, not based on what Coke is, but what Coke can bring, and that's happiness. So they've done all sorts of different stunts. If you haven't seen them, Google the Coke ha Happiness Project. It's a great example of how effective this stuff can be. So what, what they've empowered is all of these digital ambassadors who have watched or firsthand witnessed 
uh, what they're doing with the Happiness Project, and then these people are becoming the ambassadors and going and starting the conversations and talking to people about what Coke is doing, and it makes Coke, so, it takes their brand to a whole nother level, and the credibility is completely enhanced because it's not Coke saying, look how great we are, it's all of these other third parties, and the credibility just automatically goes up when someone's someone else is saying that about you. If you think about, um, like Brian and I were talking about an example about, I think we were talking about someone who, who can fix your car. Mm. And if you're the auto shop saying, oh man, we do really great work, we have great customer service, we're gonna fix your car cheaper than anyone else, that's great, but that's the brand saying that. Everyone's gonna say they have great customer service. Everyone's gonna say that they're the best place to get, you know, to have your business done or to have your car fixed. Um, but how much more likely are you to go to a place if I say, my car is broken down, and I say, look, I got this mechanic. He's taken care of my car for the past six years. He bought my old car. But it, that's a, everybody knows that's a, I mean, you guys would go to that place, right? Because you, if you trust me, first of all, and secondly, you know, I'm a raving fan. I'm like, this guy's the best. He's inexpensive. You can trust him. I'm telling you, you can, or you can slash my tires later if it doesn't work out. So. You guys would be more willing to talk and trust that person than you would like, come on down, we're here to, you know, they got a chicken on the thing or whatever. Like. Because that comes from Brian and not from the brand or the company itself, it means a lot more to you. And with social media, everyone has been, uh, our, our public in general has been more inclined to start asking for referrals from people they know. Think about how much more, if you have a question now or you need uh, a referral for something, you ask Twitter or you ask Facebook instead of asking Google. Because Google is asking the internet and Twitter or Facebook is asking your friend or someone that you've connected with in some capacity. It's just a more credible, reliable referral. So um, doing flash mobs, doing experiential marketing, doing publicity stunts really puts that in the hands of that third party and makes your brand message go so much further. Mm -hmm. From a community uh, pers perspective, the people participating, uh, they get to be a part of something big. Uh, they they like to share. They want to be like, look, like we're gonna. We took a group photo of everybody on the on the backdrop out there, and I'm gonna put that on the flash mob site this afternoon and on the Facebook page. And I can guarantee you, these guys, uh, they're like the core group here. They're gonna go there. They're gonna share. They're gonna tag it. They're gonna be like, look what I did. This was great. And their friends will see it. So it's safe to share. It's safe to get it out there. And um, it's like a um, wedding or a special event. They're going to want to put it out there and, and share it, so that helps to boost it even further. But the thing to remember and the thing that people always look at is like that Grand Central video that came up so wonderfully. Uh, that has 28.5 million views on it. That's a viral video by any standards. I mean, it's, it's enormous. But the thing that people try to do is try to make something viral. And that's not guaranteed. And from a community perspective, people know when they're being manipulated. People know when it's like, okay, guys, you know, we need to really get this out there and spread this word for X, Y, or Z. Like, they'll know if you're trying to push it. And sometimes it'll catch on and sometimes it won't, but the virality of using some kind of niche or, or something like that is, is not guaranteed by any standards. Right, so um, I can't tell you how many times I get calls from, from potential clients that say, we wanna do a viral stunt, like some sort of flash mob or something that's gonna go viral. And I have to backtrack them and ask what their goals are. You know, what, why do you wanna do this? What are you trying to achieve? Um, and, and, you know, is this the best method? Because virality, as this slide says, is not guaranteed. You're not creating a viral concept, you're creating an idea. And if the idea is good enough, yes, it may be inclined to go viral, but you need to back up and look at what your goals are and what kind of experience you're trying to create, and that's what you need to focus on. And you have to make sure if, uh, how many people are with agencies in, in the room? How many people are on the uh, corporate side? Okay, nobody's raising their hands. What do y'all do? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, from, from the uh, perspective of creating a flash mob, if you're going to look, if you're going to plan a flash mob, or if you're going to try and create an experience that you want to go viral, just make sure that the expectations are managed um, and that 
you're creating the experience knowing that it may or may not go viral. And there are some things that we're gonna go through later in the conversation where we'll tell you how to set it up to where your odds will be in, the odds will be in your favor. Um, but just make sure that you know, you can't just create a viral concept. There's no such thing. The way it goes viral is because the idea is so good and it's positioned right to start that chain of events. So I'd like to talk about a little bit <clears throat> This word, flash mob, or, or you know, where it came from and where it is today, um, according to Wikipedia, uh, about 1993 in Harper's Magazine, that's when the term was first coined. What it originally means is a large group of people gathering to do something very quickly and dispersing very quickly. That's sort of the technical term of a flash mob. And it started out with text messaging. People are like, hey, we're at this thing. Why don't you come and tell your friends and that kind of a thing. Uh, an example of that is one about, about the same time, actually. Um, I was living in California. My mom had a birthday uh, every year, selfish. But um, she had a birthday. And uh, what I did is I called a friend and I said, hey, it's my mom's birthday. Here's her phone number. Can you tell three of your friends to call and tell three of their friends to call? I didn't understand at the time the ramifications. She got like 60 phone calls that day um, from people from all over the place. And it got way outside of my circle of friends. That's how flash mobs originated. It was, let's go here. And then sort of the viral concept went out. What's happened, re I gotta stand up, I can't talk sitting down. Uh, what's happened recently a lot of times is you start to see people sprouting up like improv everywhere. Now, there's a distinction. Improv everywhere does not classify themselves as a flash mob. Be, to be perfectly frank, the Houston flash mob, I don't really consider what we do. Uh, how many people think when they hear flash mob, dance? They think it's a dance. A lot of people, in fact, one of the most common things we get asked on the flash mob thing is, when can we do the thriller dance? That's like the number one thing that everybody wants to do, the thriller. Like, it's one of the hardest dances in the world, right? But everybody wants to try it. So um, everybody thinks it's a dance. I technically, personally think of us more or less as performance art, if anything. Um, and what happened recently, in the past about six months, I had to shut down flash mob stuff altogether. Because talking about the history of flash mobs, you guys know all the stuff went on with London? you know, getting burned up and everything. Do you know what the word they were using to describe the people going through the town were? Flash mobs. So I said to the group, I said, look guys, we gotta shut stuff down for a little bit. Because if I say, we're gonna have a flash mob at Discovery Green, guess who's gonna be there in addition to us? The SWAT team <laughs> with tear gas. Like, hey, we're checking, oh God! You know, that nobody wants to do that. So uh, it, it took a little bit of a turn. You guys hear about those people going to convenience stores in like Chicago and stuff like that? What do they use for those guys? Flash mob. They started calling it flash mob. So it, it has a negative and a positive connotation, what the general public associates with. Because this is a niche thing. If you know about it, you know about it. If you see improv everywhere, if you see somebody else doing something, you think, oh, that's a flash mob. You think that's a lot of fun. But the people who do it on a regular basis and like to be involved in the community know that it's a flash mob. So a little bit of the history is to start out with people getting together with text messages. And then improv everywhere kind of came on the scene. And they, they're amazing. If you go to improveverywhere.com sometime, fantastic group. They're doing it right. And, um, and then other groups started to spread out of that. And then it got into the PR social media scene and people started, you see the commercials for like, um, we corrupted Old Navy, yeah, <laughs> the man. No, um, you see like uh, commercials for like Old Navy and they came in with the hammer pants dance. Did you guys see that? Um, they'll, they'll also do it for like United Airlines. Everybody started doing singing, like they did the food court musical thing. So they did it for um, uh, United Airlines and they do it really well because they've got like, you know, $3 million to spend on the campaign. They get like theater art people to come in. So it got a little little mixed up, but the current sort of way that it goes is flash mobs now is a mixture of not only sort of the artistic movement, but also a little bit of PR marketing movement. That's kind of where we are today with flash mobs. Does that make sense? Is that cool? Yeah, moving on? Acceptable. Acceptable, good, okay. So what we want to talk about a little bit is some of the stuff that we've done together or separately for flash mob stuff. So um, just to elaborate a little bit on what Brian was saying, um, we don't want to just talk about flash mobs today. That to us means so much more than just getting together and doing the thriller dance. If I, if I see one more Black Eyed Peas coordinated oh, yeah. event, um, I'm going to Thank pull my you, hair Oprah. out. Thank you, Oprah. Yeah, Oprah. So um, some of the other varieties of flash mobs 
can be like a mock protest or it can be, I don't know if any of you saw the escalator that was uh, converted into piano keys, um, but it can be anything that creates an experience for the public to engage in. So um, one of the things we did for TEDx Houston, we've actually done experiential marketing for them for the past two years. and. The year before last was our first big organized mock protest, and we worked backwards from the strategy of what TEDx Houston was trying to create. The entire conference is based on sharing ideas and getting out of your comfort zone to make bigger things happen. So we created an experience called the gas leak. We looked at what stops people from innovating and sharing ideas and moving things forward. And, and the key word that kept coming up in our brainstorm was apathy. So our mock protest was against, it was that there, there had been a gas leak, which stood for general apathy syndrome. So we had medics and we had people in military gear out front of TEDx Houston, and we had about 20 protesters uh, with protest signs that were generally against apathy. So good enough never was, was something that one of the signs said. Um, share more, be more, do more, was something that another one of the signs said. Um, so all these people, 20 people, chanting, one person on a bullhorn giving this general message, and then all these people chanting the message. So that right when people got out of their cars in the parking lot, they saw this protest going on. They could hear it the second they opened their car doors. And then behind the front lines of the protesters, we had uh, people in military gear handing out a gas manifesto, a general ap apathy syndrome manifesto. So it basically talked about um, the spread of ideas and what prevents us from acting on innovation. And then beyond that, we had a table of medics handing out the antidote for apathy, which is the delta symbol, which is the universal symbol for change. And we basically told them that if TEDx Houston didn't cure their apathy, that this antidote would. So from the minute that people walked up, I mean, people were uncomfortable, people were excited, people generally thought that this was a, a real protest. They were like, why is someone protesting TEDx Houston? I don't get it. Somebody's like really pissed off that TEDx is here. It's such a great thing. Like, why would they? And they would get closer and closer. And some people would make it all the way through and still not understand. They looked puzzled. They looked uncomfortable. They looked sort of excited. They would high five us. They didn't, I mean, they generally just did not know what was going on. And then they got their materials and they got to the medics table and the medics sort of explained things by saying, if this doesn't cure you, the conference will. And then they would read their manifesto. So they all get into the conference room and it was just this wild sense of chaos from the second that they got there. Um, we, we heard people whispering all about it. We heard people um, talking about how they, they, uh, you know, they, they were out of their comfort zone or they tried to avoid, I mean, we had people try and walk all the way around us just not to have to deal with the protest because they thought it was real. Um, and then the keynote speaker said, some of you saw this on the way in, some of you were probably very uncomfortable, some of you may have got it and understood because you read the signs, but whatever it was, it got you out of your comfort zone, which is what we want to do all day today. We want you out of your comfort zone so that you'll listen and you'll accept these new ideas and then you'll take action when you walk out of here. So um, that's just sort of the way we work. We look at the end goal of what the person is trying to achieve and then we work back from, backwards from that so that we can create an experience that's not just, I mean, and no offense to Brian because I think it's really cool what they do, um, but for when you're doing uh, experiential marketing or flash mobs or planning something like that for a brand, you really have to make sure that you're not doing it just to do it. You have to really understand what the client is trying to achieve and then work backwards from that so that you create an experience that really leads the people to feel the way that the brand needs them to feel and then to talk about it and to spur on those discussions. So that's something to keep in mind. Just always look towards the goal build in the strategy based on the goal, and then think about what you want those people to walk away feeling and then what you want them to do and make sure that your experience that you're creating does all of those things. Yeah, and 
it, it's no offense at all because I, I look at it this way. Um, my clients are my group members. Those are my clients. I don't own this like, well, I'll talk, we'll talk about that in a minute about uh, getting ideas, but it, it's the same thing, only different because, you know, um, when you're doing that, you're dealing with either uh, the people you're, you know, the brand you're putting out for, or the people that are, you have to have people somehow to, to do these events, and so my goal is always to keep our people happy and the people around us happy. So, um, but I wanted to, she talked about a great example. I'm gonna talk about a little bit of a, a cool thing, but kind of a bummer too. Um, I don't want to just talk about like how it can be great. I want to talk about some things to avoid a little bit too. Um, and the example is Daybreakers. We did. Uh, I was contact. I was in Kansas City, Missouri, and um, we were contacted by a person. I'm a filmmaker, so I uh, we got in contact by somebody who who was promoting the film Fa Daybreakers. I'm like, oh, cool. You know, I'm gonna help promote a film. Well, the thing is that they needed this done while I was out of town in a short amount of time. So I thought, okay. And then they asked me what I wanted to do, or they told me what they would like to have happen. I said, okay, well, we can work together on this. Let's try to do something. And the reason it was not cool was this. Um, when I had the flash mob folks stand up, they didn't tell me that they were going to have them wear signs around them and uh, sort of stand in the corner and that kind of a thing. They were making it sound like they were gonna, what they wanna do is have them have, vamp they're gonna give them like vampire blood and like these these packets of like fake blood and so it sounded like fun like they're going to be like vampires and kind of follow people around vampirely um it's a word uh so what they had them do instead was turn into corporate mouthpieces which i don't have a problem with doing so we've done stuff for other people we're about to talk about the astros which is a cool example um but they tr they got a little too uh messagey rather than fun at least for our group and they got about, I lost about you know, 10 or 15 people out of the group because they're like, we're not doing this for Universal, we want to have fun or whatever. That's an example of getting an idea from a community perspective of what it is that's being asked of you and how you're going to get involved and how you're going to work together. But the good example of it is, is that I managed the entire event virtually from my brother-in-law's living room on my laptop. I was able to send out an email, I was able to get maps, I was able to contact with the person get directions, uh, do updates, and gather photos at the end and put them on the website in another state. So that's kind of a cool the virtual management of an entire group of people. But I just wanted to mention that because beware when you're doing these things, how it's gonna turn out as an overall experience, not only for, is it getting the message out, yeah, but how is it leaving a taste in the mouth of the people, unless they're hired. I'm not talking about hired people, we're talking about you know the community and the PR thing, but um, for your, for your people that are more community driven. Uh, keep that in mind because they're gonna find out. And you, it, it wasn't meant to be a secret, but it was just, it came out wrong. It wasn't managed very well, so. I think that's a really good point to bring up is that if you are doing this for a brand, maintaining the organic feel of it mm -hmm. and the element of surprise is yeah. really important, not over commercializing it. So with TEDx Houston, people really thought it was a protest because we were not wearing TEDx Houston t-shirts. We were not wearing TEDx Houston uh, lanyards. We were not wearing black sheep, uh, you know, anything that identified us. Nobody knew who the group was that was doing it, and nobody knew that TEDx had actually known that it was all gonna happen. So it seemed very genuine, um, and that element of surprise and people trying to figure out what was going on was what engaged them. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, like the missed opportunity with Daybreakers is if they wouldn't have tried to commercialize it and put the signs around the necks, it could have been a really cool opportunity. It could have, if they would have done the vampire-y thing, it would have been really cool because it would have felt more authentic and less like a brand. People don't, um, they like the authentic experience. They like, um, you know, they like real. They like People real. They real. like entertainment. They don't. If if you're all signaged up and you're wearing branded T-shirts and it's all very commercialized, it feels like an advertisement. It feels very contrived and and unnatural. And so and and less expected, more like paid for event. So keeping that organic keep feeling real, is man. really yeah. Keep it real. Keep it real, real. And a good example of that is the Houston Astros. Um, Houston Astros contacted us, the Houston Flash Mob, and the reason they were cool was this. They said, hey, we like what you guys do. We want it. we're doing our college classic is coming up. I don't know anything about baseball, so I was like, that sounds like fun. Um, 
and they said, we want to do an event to promote the College Classic. What do you want to do for us? Or what would you like to do? And I said, well, learning from the Daybreakers thing, I was like, well, here's the thing I don't want to do. I don't want you to tell me what to do. Now, that sounds really, really like arrogant or whatever, but I'm coming from a mindset of as I want to protect my, my clan, basically. You know, I don't want to be told X, Y, and Z because that takes a lot of the creativity and fun out of it. Uh, if they have, you know, unless they have a great idea. But uh, in this case, they allowed us to come in and stew over it for a while and then come to them with an idea. They're like, yeah, that's fun. Um, and the point that you see there about the organized chaos was because, and this is so cool. I got to stand up again. Uh, this is really cool because this is probably my favorite the thing I've ever had a chance to be, I'm gonna say be a part of, not run, because what happened is I came up with about 5% of the idea, which was um, it, uh, uh, I was about to give up actually, and my wife was like, don't give up, why don't you try this? We did something called Invisiball, and what Invisiball was is we showed up with no balls, no bats, and no mitts, no nothing, just a bunch of jerseys. And right here at City Center, when you guys go out, you know that green area right by Ruggles Green? We had a bunch of people come and do a baseball game in that area at Ruggles Green with no balls, no bats, no mitts. And the 95% other part of it, and the reason this was organized chaos, is because the group came up with everything else. They came up with the name of the teams. They came up with chants. I had them show up with uh, blank billboards so that when they came up with the name, they could write their own slogans. I mean, they fully came up with, we're going to get you, no, you're not, like a whole thing. And I said, here's the idea. We do this and this. One team has to win, and they have to win by X amount of points, and that's all you know. Pick a, pick a pitcher, pick a pitcher, spread out your teams, make up your own lineup, whatever. Ha you can have somebody charge the mound. You can whatever. They came up with the batting order, what happens, who wins, by how much, and how that happens. They did 95% of the work. And it was super duper cool because it was total organized chaos. And that was by putting some good boundaries and stuff that we talked about later. And then the Astros were there, but they were on the sidelines just handing out tickets and stuff like that and then putting it up later. So the two points that, that come out of this example, um, number one, the people that were participating were super invested because they got to own it. Um, that's, what, that's what Brian's trying to communicate is that they they were invested because they got to make the decisions. Mm -hmm. They got to shape the way the flash mob looked. So that empowered them. It made them excited. They really got into character. They were super excited. They were. And and so like giving them a little bit of ownership is is really brilliant. I will say that if you're doing something like this for your brand, letting go of that control can be really difficult. Um, it opens the door for new risks, for things to go wrong. Um, and so when you're doing it for a brand, you may want to uh, reel that back in a little bit and have a little bit more control, but you can find other ways to make it really fun for them to participate. Mm -hmm. But you have to control it a little bit. Yeah, to keep it safe for the Astros, what we did is that we didn't say anywhere on the mailings or anything, and we didn't get paid for this, by the way, we just did it. Um, uh, we said that we didn't say anything on the mailings or anything like that that this was for the Houston Astros. But what we did is we made a deal with the Astros so that afterwards they would give us like 10 tickets for people, sort of the, the follow-up is for 10 people of the group. And what I did is whoever posts, the first 10 people to post a comment or the first 10 people to tag somebody will get a ticket to the college. So we used it to, to recruit and to get hits on our page Generalize. and to get people to share. And um, it was all from the Astros, and it said the College Classic, and it's gonna be during this date, so we gave them a plug and all that stuff. And so they helped us out, we helped us out, and it was a total win-win. And it was super awesome, it was very successful, gave them a lot of publicity and stuff, it was really cool. And the best part is, at the very end, this is just an anecdote, there was a family that came with a little girl, she got the Grand Slam home run, that one, and they picked her up and they carried her off of the field. And so my favorite part of the whole thing was the family, and she's like this. It was really cute. It was a whole family participating, and it was like a family memory, and I love that, that like they walked away saying, hey, you remember when we blah, 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 and she was so tiny, it was so great, and they cheered and everything, it was, it was perfect. It was really cute. So that was a good example of how brands can, can orchestrate a flash mob but not infiltrate the flash mob with branding and commercialization. So like Brian said, 
we were completely gone by the time the Astros folks came out. And they came out and passed out information and stuff. Mm -hmm. But the crowd was intrigued. They were entertained. They were we had a good time. Everybody who was involved participating had a good time. I mean, it, it was just so neat how everybody just sort of gravitated towards watching. And then once we were gone, the Astros people came out. So it, it just, it was very separate and it was very casual. And that left everybody feeling really good about it. Yeah, it was, it was, it was funny to watch the security officer's reaction, by the way, every time. And that's, I mean, that's a trend that you can follow. Um, so we're actually in the process right now of organizing a ninja flash mob. So if anybody's into that, let me know. Um, and the ninja flash mob is for a client and there will be no mention of the client. There will be no branding. And we had to talk to our client about how that would work. But so the entire flash mob is going to be completely organic. The only way it's going to associate back to our client is the way that it's shared after the fact. So it's going to be a really fun experience. It's going to be um, totally free of commercialization until it gets shared online. So um, there's just different ways to approach that where you can have a healthy balance. Was that the one you were telling me about with the real swords and the blood sport and all that? Yes. Is that the one? No. Murder. Okay. So you've got a lot of information now about flash mobs are effective, flash mobs work, flash mobs are good. I want to talk a little bit about, now that we have that information, um, how do you run a flash mob? Now this is a handout because you're about to see four slides that are like wall of text. Be like, oh, okay, I'm checking out. Please don't check out. This is information that's really important. Um, so there's a couple different things, um, and we're going to go back and forth about how to do this. Um, we've got about 1,500 plus people on our mailing list for the Houston Flash Mob, um, and the recruiting aspect of it. I wish I had more information because it'd be perfectly honest, I'm a little baffled. But I think the biggest part is one. Put a sign up form on your mailing on your website or when you use MailChimp or something. There's a list of resources, I think, on the second page. MailChimp is your best friend. It's a free mailing list piece of software. Create a list, create a form, find the link for it, and send it out on your mailing. People will just sign up for free. It's fantastic. It's amazing. So when you set it up, the email list is the number one way we get people to come to our events. And they can forward it on and stuff like that. So recruiting. Um, another thing for recruiting is I always ask people when they come to the event, I always say, how many people, like you guys in the back, did you saw in the mail, where did you see the thing to come, was it on Facebook you saw that? Okay, so I put a thing out on Facebook and um, within the end of the day we had, um, we had over 60 people sign up for the mailing list and we had five today and that's another thing we'll talk about later is the percentages you can expect. But um, for recruiting, Create a mailing list and just put a form out there and just start building, building that mailing list. It seems fundamental, but for Flash Mob, it's a really great way to get them going. And then the other thing that helps with recruiting and for growing your guys is you empower your people to do things. Uh, we asked for photographers and video, videographers, an example of the Astros thing. That thing was, we encourage people to come up with their own ideas, to do things that are creative, like we did a thing called Mall Rats. We went to Memorial City Mall and wore rat outfits, and we ran through the mall after a piece, somebody with a piece of cheese attached to the front of their shirt. Good, right? So, um, but what we did is we just said, show up and wear your own outfit. I didn't tell, I said, you can wear ears, a tail, whatever, and people show up with paint on their face, with a full on tail, big old ears. We allowed them to be creative, and that was a really big, important part of it. Um, ask them to tweet during the event. So many people, of course, are on social media, so we give them the opportunity, and this usually happens at the beginning, is you say, okay, how many people heard about this out of the other? And then you say, hey guys, while we're getting ready, why don't you put a tweet out about what we're doing? And they will. They'll put a bunch of tweets out, which is super cool. And then just, of course, secure a hashtag for whatever you're doing. So we had like mall rats, I think, or maybe we didn't. I might be not practicing when I'm preaching. I'm just saying that we should do these things. But uh, um, to get the hashtag for what we're talking about. Do you want to find this? Um, the only thing I would say is that you, if you are doing this on the corporate side, you have already a brand community around that. So making sure that you're utilizing um, recruiting tools that your client may already have in place or that you as a, a company employee may already have in place. Using em employees as a resource is always really helpful. Um, and then um, as far as empowering other people to be digital ambassadors, um, finding ways to 
make sure that the photos come back to you or the oh, yeah. video comes back to you that um, people are capturing is really important. Um, so making sure that they're not just tweeting during the event, but that there's a collective uh, site for people to go and post their resources, their feedback to talk about. So, so sort of creating a forum ahead of time so that people know where to share that information so that that information can go as far as possible and that so also the brand can use that. This is a really valuable tool for creating engagement on social media for the brand, which is something that as marketers we struggle with constantly is how do we get people to participate on social media sites? So, um, you know, enabling them to do that and talking with people who are participating ahead of time about making sure they come back to social media and share that stuff is really key. Uh, I want to, I don't I just mentioned this because I don't know if it's on the, uh, do you guys have the resources saying the second page? Is is file mail on there, the word file mail under resources? No, okay, filemail.com, F-I-L-E-M-A-I-L.com, write that down. File mail is a free service that allows you to send like, I think the free service lets you send two gigabytes, but I always tell people who come for photography stuff, you go to filemail.com, it allows you to upload multiple files and send it to you, and then you just download a zip file. It's the number one best way I've found to get photos or videos from people, because videos are big. But it'll send up to two gigs for free. And you ask them, send us your photos and videos on filemail.com. Just wanted to mention that, because that's the you number one resource. You send it's another, another good one. That you send it's good, too. I think you send it as 500 meg or something, though. So filemail is the biggest one I've found. Awesome. OK, we're going to go through this, because we've got about five minutes. Um, there, and we may skip some of this because it's, but the, there is one thing I absolutely want to talk about. Priority number one, safety and security. If a kid gets hurt, your flash mob group is done. Your brand is in trouble. You have to do everything you can for safety and security. That, in, that includes when you send out your email. Hey guys, like for the invisible thing, I said, please do not bring bats, balls, uh, you know, face masks, it, just stuff like that. I had to be clear, like, please do not do this. Secondly, for the mall rats thing, I must have said it six times. Hey guys, we have to go slowly. Please be careful, and please be careful of the people around you. If somebody gets knocked over, if a little kid gets <laughs> trampled or something like that, like, you're, you, you're done. Like, that's, that's a terrible thing. Nobody wants that. Safety and security is absolute priority number one, no matter what, when you do these things. Particularly if you're a brand. You yeah. don't want a PR crisis no. on your hands. So consider all things that can go wrong before you execute. I don't know anything about permits. Uh, permits, I mean, permits are, are something that we could talk about for an entire session. But if you are doing this as a brand or as a company, don't expect that you can just choose a venue and show up. Make sure that you do your resources, your research, you ask permission. Um, and you investigate that. A lot of uh, anything that's going to happen on public space will require a permit. And if you're doing it as a brand, it's not okay to just sort of ignore that. If you're doing it for fun, it can be acceptable. But if you're doing it as a brand, make sure you do permit research or contact someone who knows. Oh. I was trying to pull up an example email. It's not linking, so that's awesome. Um, this is about getting the word out. So um, you have to double check. These are just mistakes that I've made. Like I put the wrong address. That was awesome. Uh, double check your information. Um, link to and embed maps. You can use Jing, J-I-N-G, which is a free piece of software to capture. Like from your screen, you can draw a thing. Grab an image of the map and then draw little arrows. Meet here. Do not meet here. Big red circle. Things like that. Um, uh, provide detailed instructions. Like arrive. If you want people to arrive at 10:45, tell them 10:15. It happens often. And make um, sure they understand the meeting spot very clearly. Yeah, that's super important. Like, we were meeting it here. Like, for these guys, I said, we're meeting it. I didn't want to tell them you're going to go to Norris Conference Center. You're going to go to the thing around the corner, up to the third floor. No, we're meeting in anthropology. That's it. Simple, easy. Here is an actual link on Google Maps to the exact store with the satellite view. Like, if you didn't make it, I'm sorry. I thought I did everything I could. Um, and then the general who, what, when, where, and how. Um, big, big important thing, big bold, who, what, make sure you get all of these every time if you, you'll miss something. Um, text alerts, broadtexter.com. This is a free service where people can sign up for text messages and to send a message. It goes out to, I think we have like 70 people on our text message alert thing. You can use them to start flash mobs. You text something and all of a sudden somebody gets it and they go crazy and it, and it happens. Broadtexter is great for that. Um, 
And then make sure you give enough time. I know this seems pretty fundamental, but uh, you, we were lucky with the Shippel folks that we got a group, but um, you have to give at least a week or so because they have to plan for the weekend. They have to make you know time and stuff like that. And she says, oh, internet's back, yay. <laughs> Things out of nature. Let's see. Hey, Brian, I think we're about out of time, but the last thing I wanted to touch on is something that is in this set of bullets, and that's keep it short and sweet. Keep it simple. When you're coming up with your ideas for uh, a flash mob or some sort of experience that you're trying to create in public, people have a tendency to make things very complicated because they want it to be elaborate. They want it. They just want a lot going on. And and keeping it simple can really help you avoid issues. And something as simple as like a random guy in a bear suit or like 10 people doing something that's coordinated and unexpected, as long as it's unexpected, it does not have to be complicated. And trust me, when the more complicated you make it, the more variables there are for things to go wrong or things to look chaotic. And the, the key important thing to make happen is to make sure that it's clear what's happening and it looks very organized. So keeping it simple, the, the simpler it is, the more organized it's going to be, the less possibility for things to go wrong. So just keep that in mind and, and try and keep it simple. I have a couple more things, but it is noon. Do we have two minutes for questions? No, that's a big stop sign. <laughs> Can we get one or, anybody have one or two questions or any questions you'd like to cover? Brian and I will be around, so if anybody has questions or if you've been thinking about planning something like this, both of us are really passionate about the topic, so, which is why we're still talking after time. Um, so if anybody wants to talk or pick our brains about it, you know, come find us. We'd be happy to chat with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We love you all. <laughs>